Troughing around impacted third molar teeth is a key part of just about every impaction that you'll face. Now, as a general practitioner, it's something you have to kind of get your head around because we're not used to doing this on a routine basis. So when we're taking out other teeth in the mouth, typically now we're almost shying away from bone removal in some instances to try to be more conservative for, say, placement of an implant afterwards. When we get back to the posterior of the mandible though, we have to try to shift our thinking into one that makes more sense for the removal of the tooth based on the area of the mouth that we're working in. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is if you remember back to our very first lecture, or one of the first videos that we did, we talked about bone and the different types of bone. Now we have a lot of cortical bone in the posterior mandible as opposed to the cortical bone in the anterior mandible. What that means is that the cortical bone isn't as forgiving, so it doesn't flex or bend or expand the same way that cancellous bone would, which means that we then need to actually physically eliminate it using our handpiece to get some space, to get some clearance for the tooth to then be removed. So you don't want to try to overcome the cortical bone back here with elevator forces only because you're going to end up with some untoward complications that you want to avoid at all costs. Now, when you're removing bone, it's basically gonna be dictated by the orientation of the tooth and the impaction that you're facing. So there isn't necessarily a standard way of doing this each and every time. Sometimes you might need a little more bone removal. Other times you could be a little bit more conservative. Anytime that you pick up a handpiece with the intention of removing bone around a tooth, you need to have a plan in place and you need to understand why you're about to remove the bone that you're going to remove and you need to be very deliberate in terms of your execution of the plan that you create. Now, removing bone should allow you to either make the extraction faster or easier, one of the two. So don't just pick up a handpiece and start blasting bone away and think that you just need to take away as much as you can to free up that tooth so that you can get it out. Anytime that you're looking at removing bone versus maybe sacrificing tooth, you should probably err on the side of sectioning the tooth or cutting the tooth versus taking away more bone. Now, we want to be conservative somewhat back here is what I'm trying to get at in that we don't want to weaken the mandible too much. So the mandible is a functional bone that it's under a lot of heavy stresses. Once you take the third molar out, you've opened up a line of weakness in the mandible. And if you take more bone away in addition to that tooth, now that's even weaker and you could subject your patient to a possible post-operative fracture or even a fracture as you're doing the procedure. So be conservative, but be deliberate. Now, when we're doing our bone removal back there, we also want to keep some cortical bone. So our trough should be going down alongside the tooth, but we want to try to preserve some of this cortical bony collar. Now, why do we do that? Well, we want to have something that's very solid to place an elevator on to fulcrum off of. So if you take a lot of the cortical bone away and you drop it way down kind of beneath where you want to have your purchase point, you're going to have much less of a levering action and less ability to lift those teeth out. So try to conserve some for that reason as well. The other thing that we want to conserve bone for, and I don't know if we can see it so well on here, but we want to try to keep a bony collar in behind this lower second molar. So there'll be some bone here, cortical bone, that comes in behind the second molar that's very important for healing. So you always try to preserve that bit of bone if you can when you're doing your trough or your bone removal. Also, when you're trying to do that, that's gonna prevent you from hopefully damaging this tooth, which is a possibility when you're running a high-speed drill in the back of the mouth where access and visibility is sometimes a little bit poorer. Now when we actually make this trough, the depth that we want to get to is typically to the CEJ of the tooth. Now the amount of bone removal, of course, will be dictated by the type of impaction, the angulation and orientation of the tooth once you've exposed it. But generally you want to take your bone removal down to the CEJ or maybe just slightly beyond. So what you're trying to do is get past the height of contour on the tooth and get somewhere where you can then place a purchase point or get your elevator down deeper on the tooth to gain a mechanical advantage to help to elevate that tooth out. So you're basically trying to get rid of any bony interferences in the path of withdrawal for that tooth to allow you then to use gentler forces when you're elevating on the tooth, which then will result in fewer complications. Now the other goal of bone removal down here is basically to get the bone off of the tooth so that you can orient yourself 
to how that impaction is sitting because sectioning is going to be the next step and in order to section this tooth successfully you need to know exactly where you're oriented and where say the buccal groove is for example so that you can start to split that tooth perfectly in half. So how do we go about selecting the appropriate handpiece to trough around third molars and section these teeth? Well, first off, we need to find a handpiece that is very efficient at cutting and very safe when we're working back in this region of the mouth. Now, that limits us to a few different options. The first would be the straight surgical handpiece, which is going to feel a little bit foreign to a lot of general practitioners, or something that might be a little bit more familiar in our hands, which would be a 45-degree surgical handpiece. Now, the 45-degree sur surgical handpieces that you could look at would be, say, a Sabre 45 or an Impact Air 45, those are both air-driven handpieces, meaning that they do spin at a high speed, but they don't have a lot of torque. And torque is something that I would suggest that you key in on when you're selecting a handpiece. Torque is basically what's going to allow you to section through a tooth or cut bone without having the burr stall out on you. So imagine that you're doing a crown prep and you're using an air-driven handpiece. Sometimes if you get cutting too quickly or leaning too much on that handpiece, the burr is going to stop and that's because the torque is very low. When you're using an electric handpiece like this or a, a surgical handpiece that is a straight surgical handpiece, they are going to keep spinning. Now the only downside to that is that they are going to be generating heat versus stalling out. So the more friction there is, the more pressure there is, the more heat that's generated, meaning that you have to have adequate irrigation throughout this procedure. Now the irrigant is either going to come from your assistant while you're doing this, or it's going to come from the handpiece in terms of either an external irrigation port or in the case of this 45 degree handpiece, it actually has a port on it as well that can be adjusted to eliminate the air spray and just use a water jet. Now, my only complaint with using this electric 45 handpiece back here is that it doesn't have a source of isotonic irrigation. Now, I suppose you could set it up that way, but basically when I hook this into my unit, my delivery unit, it's using the delivery unit water. So that is clean water. It's definitely okay to use, but it's not as ideal as it could be if we were using, say, a straight surgical handpiece with an external port, surgical tubing, and then, say, like some sterile saline, which is osmotically balanced. So that's going to be kinder to the tissues to use a different type of irrigant than what you're going to get from these. But they are nice in some situations in terms of access and visibility to the back of the mouth and reaching certain teeth in order to section them. The other thing is they are dual purpose. So if you buy one of these, it's not like you just have to take out third molars with them. You can use them for other procedures in select cases. These high torque surgical hand pieces that I'm discussing here are going to be cutting 50% more efficiently than say air driven hand pieces. Now that is very important because research actually shows that the faster you do these procedures without being reckless of course, the less post-op pain the patient's going to experience and the less swelling they're going to experience. So you want something that's going to get the job done very quickly and very cleanly and what you need for that is a high speed high torque hand piece. How fast? Well, you want it spinning at at least 80,000 RPMs, could be up to 120,000 RPMs in a straight handpiece. And basically what you're going to find with them is when you get a straight handpiece, say you buy your external motor or you have a delivery unit that's got an electric attachment, you want a straight handpiece that has a 1 to 2 increaser. So that basically means that it's going to take your max of 40,000 RPMs, which is what a lot of these delivery units have, and it's going to double that into 80,000 RPMs. Now you can also buy one to three increasers for these straight surgical hand pieces in select brands, and that's then going to take your 40,000 and it's going to triple it into 120,000 RPMs. So the faster it's spinning, again, the quicker it's going to cut, especially if it's a high torque hand piece like I was just discussing. Now straight hand pieces are nice because they do accommodate longer burrs. So if we take a peek at this burr here, that is what is sliding into that surgical hand piece. The length of that shank actually allows the burr to spin more concentrically. So you get less vibration, less chatter when you're cutting around these teeth, which is a smoother, nicer experience for your patients, especially if they're still somewhat awake. So they're maybe just slightly sedated, or some people even would do this just with anesthetic, depending on what type of patient they are. 
Getting back to heat generation for a moment, sometimes the flutes on these burrs will get clogged with bone as you're troughing around the tooth. Now it's important to stop every once in a while just to swipe off the flutes, get them cleaned off with your finger or a gauze in order to allow this to keep spinning and cutting efficiently and cleanly around the tooth. If it's clogged up and it's cutting inefficiently, what's happening then is it's generating friction, generating heat, which is then going to damage some of the bone cells, which then increase the post-operative pain that the patient feels, and it will hinder or impair the healing slightly through the post-operative phase. So we've got our handpiece figured out. Now, what was that burr that I was just showing you? Well, this is a burr that I like to use. This is a 1703 L burr. Now, the nice thing about this burr is that it has the ability to give you a bit of a depth gauge or a bit of a reference as to where you're cutting through the tooth or how deep you're sectioning. So the length of the flutes on this burr are actually about 7.8 millimeters long. Now the nice part about that is that the average clinical crown height of a mandibular molar is about seven and a half millimeters. So you know that once you've sunk your flutes into that tooth, you're just about through the clinical crown of that tooth. Now the other thing is that the average buccolingual width of a mandibular molar is about nine millimeters to 10 and a half millimeters. So look what happens when I lay this across this tooth. So this is just your average size tooth I'm not all the way through the lingual, which is absolutely ideal. So you always want to cut about two thirds of the way through these teeth, and then you want to split them with your elevator. So again, using these flutes as a depth gauge, you can sink this into the buckle of the tooth, swipe upwards towards the occlusal, and as you're doing that, you can watch how deep you are in the tooth and make sure that you're not puncturing through the lingual aspect of that bone. Now in contrast to this, you could have a 703 burr or 702 burr, which I have in here now. The flutes on this are only about 4.8 millimeters in length. So that is not really something that's gonna help you out too much. You're gonna know that you're not through the tooth when you're cutting with this, but how much farther you have left to go is tough to say. So it's something where this is often a little more ideal, but again, designed for the straight surgical handpiece. So something that you'll have to consider maybe switching to if you wanna have that luxury. Now the diameter of the tip here is about 2.1 millimeters, which again is nice because it gives you a nice width for that trough when you actually make it around the tooth. So it gives you just enough that you can get an elevator down in there, but not too much as to take away too much of that cortical bone that I was talking about earlier that we're gonna be using to fulcrum off of.